Hi, my name is Ryan Slobogin, and I'm here with Martin Thompson. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Martin. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Another good conference. <laughs> so you were recently recognized as a distinguished speaker mm -hmm. with GoTo. Congratulations on that. Thank you. It was a surprise. <laughs> Uh, when did you start speaking at Trifor conferences? I think it was early in 2010. I remember having a discussion with Jim Weber back when we were at Dave Farley and I were working in LMAX. And we kind of been locked away, building an exchange, having a fun time. And we met up with Jim for a beer. So talking about some of the things that we were doing. And Jim said, you've got to come and talk at one of these conferences about some of what you were doing. And so we came along in the spring of 2010, went to go to London and did our first talk which was kind of interesting and intimidating, coming right on out there down north, giving an excellent talk. So we, we get out there kind of shy and not really sure what to do, but it was a fun thing to do. Excellent. And how many different conferences have you spoken at since then? I think many now. I've probably getting on for sort of five, six a year for the last three years or so. Right, and sort of getting to see a lot of the world, it's interesting to do that. Cool. And what motivated you to to do those talks to begin mm -hmm. with? Like what, what was the background? Why why get involved in conference speaking? Yeah, well, having founded a small startup, recruitment is also a really interesting challenge. And when you're small, you don't have the money to pay big salaries, you don't have a big name at that stage, so how can you get people in? And what we thought would be really cool was uh, explain some of what we were doing, because we discovered we had some great problems and sort of uh, solving really interesting computer science issues. But let's get out and talk a bit about this, and if we do, we'll actually see do maybe people will come along and approach us. We weren't sure if it was going to work very well or not, and we were really surprised that it was very successful as a means of recruiting people and coming to us. It was kind of a combination of conference speaking, blogging, open source, doing some journalist interviews, and trying to get the word out about what we were doing at LMAX. So one of the things that LMAX released was Disruptor and that was made open source and how did you find that work from a community perspective? Did you mm -hmm. get good feedback from that, contributions? How, what was the whole process like there? Yeah, that was fascinating. It was something we developed internally. We discovered lots of issues with performance of queues and locking and we started some discussions with some people externally who were very good in this area and as we were collaborating with those we discovered doing it in the open was very healthy for us as well. So we were getting interesting feedback. We decided then, well, let's just go the whole hog and open source this. And the surprise was the amount of feedback we got really helped improve the product. We found that we had a certain number of edge cases internally, but nowhere near as much as whenever the whole community started banging on the tool. And I think that the thing that came out of it that was the surprise was not only did they find lots of quality issues that improved the product, it really helped with usability, API design, and being used in interesting cases. And then some of the feedback we had was like, oh, there's ways you can improve this, do different things. Sometimes it would come as just even a question that someone would say, well, we'd like to do something in this sort of way. And in looking into that as a problem, we actually discovered we refined the design. That had interesting side effects in that we really improve things like performance and usability and then they come back in to our own software so we're able to reintegrate those changes. I think when you do stuff in the open, the quality that can come out is very surprising. I think there's something when you just develop internally in house, you just kind of focus just on your thing at hand. You don't have to revisit or refine in any way in the same way as you do when you do it in the open and you're collaborating with people and taking that feedback. One of the beliefs that I've developed is that using something open source, you immediately have a lot of benefits over anything at all that you develop internally. Mm -hmm. So something that you develop internally only ever has you as a customer. You're probably going to reinvent a bunch of things that mm -hmm. are already in existence. And anything that has been viewed by even one more group team person has extra peer reviews or anything you've mm -hmm. done internally. Which it, do you find that's the case, or do you think that there are some things that it's better to keep them internal? Because it sometimes seems that there's a tension between you want to develop something internal that's custom to your needs, mm -hmm. but also you want to use something that's solid, proven, vetted, etc. Mm -hmm. I think it is more effort to do something externally, because you have to interact with the community. Also, people put more effort into doing things like, I find a lot of the work I did in the structure, I do it on my own time, because you still got the dead job to do, so you end up doing a lot of that. 
But what becomes kind of interesting is how other people look at the code and they think about it in other ways. And it's very easy even inside a company that you get multiple people look at a problem, but you tend to have groupthink way of doing things and everybody kind of to almost hom homogeneously end up with the same type of thinking and the same sort of approach. You break that when you bring in external thinking and things that you, it, it's not just the one person's blind to, I've seen the whole team can go blind to a way of doing something that just taking an outside view in can just turn that around, they can just even ask a simple question like doing the four year old child thing of why? <laughs> why have you done that? And then you go, I said we didn't really think about that. And you start and you revisit, ah, that's really interesting, we can massively improve things. I guess as long as you can get past the answer of why, just because, why, just yeah. because. <laughs> well, you have to have a good answer for it, just because, because if you're just doing it for no good reason. Yeah. Yeah, I guess looking, reevaluating re those kinds of assumptions can be really good. Mm -hmm. Speaking of things that are often overlooked, one of the things that you have a strong interest in is mechanical sympathy. Mm -hmm. What's mechanical sympathy? Ah, mechanical sympathy. It's the term blatantly stolen from Jackie Stewart, the racing driver. So, uh, Formula One, three times world champion. He had a, a view that the best drivers are people who work in harmony with their car. You have to understand it well enough to get the best out of it. That doesn't mean that you know how to build a car. It doesn't mean that you know how to strip a gearbox or an engine. But if you've got a good idea of how it works and how it functions, you can get the best out of it. Well, today we seem to have gone so far up the stack with so many layers of abstraction, we seem to have lost what it's about. I find it kind of interesting that, like we say we do computer science, but how many people these days actually understand how a computer actually works? How many people actually apply a scientific method? There's a lot of folklore and there's a lot of opinion that people approach things and they don't measure, they don't test. They just act on things that they kind of believe in without any real basis for what's behind it. And what I'm finding more and more is, and I think it's, it's unfortunate in how we're recruiting and rewarding people in this industry is people tend to go with frameworks because frameworks look good on CVs or resumes. And the time it takes to learn some of these frameworks is quite substantial. Whereas, is that really the best use of our time? Is that optimal for how we can improve ourselves? Like there's an opportunity cost to this. I find it can be just as easy to understand how a CPU works as it can be to find out, say, for example, how a container works. And yet we find that we've got these hugely complicated containers and we don't need a fraction of the features. And so we bring in all of that extra code, the time to learn it, the complexity that comes with it, the fact that if it's got bugs, we're stuck with that in our code. And yet we could have been spending that time on other things and actually having more control of our own destiny. I think something's gone very odd in our industry where we just seem to gather all of these technologies together rather than actually focus on solving the problem and understanding the stack that's underneath us. So it almost becomes like architecture's game of bingo. Mm -hmm. You want to put together a bunch of names and get a Y in our box or an X? Or <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's become almost a joke in the industry that when people turn up on a project, the first thing they're doing is like they're installing Maven, they're downloading half the internet, the next thing they're installing Spring, Hibernate, whatever, and they haven't even looked at what the problem is they're about to solve yet. Like, I find sometimes there's so much code on some projects and so much framework that it's actually easier to just go to the customer, find out what needs to be built, and to rebuild from scratch is faster than understanding the current code that's there, that that's not a good place to be. Yet that seems to be incredibly common in how we're now approaching software. Like, at the end of the day, we're not actually paid to write software, we're paid to solve business problems. Why is that not the first thing we're going off and doing is finding out what is the problem we're solving for some end user? Like I heard the group description uh, just here yesterday at the conference is that when people go and buy a quarter inch drill, they don't actually want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. <laughs> That's what we should be going at. It's like, what's the problem we're solving? Then having a good kit back of solutions or techniques to deliver to that solution. So I think there's an impression that in the age of the JVM and other virtual machines that maybe you don't need to care as much about what the CPU is doing. Mm -hmm. How did focusing on the CPU and what is doing help you out at Almax? What kinds of benefits were you able to get as a result? For example, most people are unaware that the reason most of the software runs slowly is usually because of cache misses. If they're not taking network trips, which can be a massive cost, like if you're making 40 calls across a network to do a simple task, that's obviously going to be expensive. We have speed of light issues just in doing that. 
But if you're even working within the same machine, the biggest problem we face as a cache mist, that most people aren't aware that on a modern x86 processor, a single cache miss is usually a lost opportunity to have executed over 500 CPU instructions. That is really significant. And so actually, the, the processing instructions, we keep hearing that CPUs aren't getting faster, that's something we, we must learn to cope with. But if you actually measure CPUs, they spend most of their time idle. We don't have an issue with them being faster, we have an issue with feeding them. And how we feed them is an algorithm problem and a data layout problem. So if, if we have issues with using many of the VMs that are running today, it's not the VMs the problem, it's the algorithms and how we access memory. Because the ability to access memory is really important for how it happens. Our hardware friends, then they design memory subsystems, they know there's a lot of latency to be in memory, so they work at ways of hiding that. And what they do is they take three basic bets. First bet they take is that it's temporal and that things that you've used recently, you'll use again recently. So we're caching things and we're pulling them forward in the least recently used scenario. So that's kind of useful. They also take a bet on the spatial side of things. So things that are close together tend to be used together. Again, so the fields within a class, if you're using one field, you're likely to use another field again very soon. And this was really interesting in design, that if you've got classes or structures that are very coherent in their design, they're cohesive in how you've got the, the data behavior together, you tend to get less cache misses. When you're designing code and you're seeing a lot of feature movement and you see one class is going over and keeps taking something from another class, it's typically cache missing because it's not there and it's not together. So that's the second bet. The third bet they take on is that our code has certain patterns of access and those patterns can possibly be predictable. So for example, if I'm going to walk through an array of memory, they can spot that pattern if you're walking through the array and they can prefetch the memory into you as you actually get to it. And the patterns don't even have to be just a step one at a time. They can be quite large uh, strides or leaps. And so you could be walking across structures or objects or something that are all together in an array and that becomes efficient. Kind of interesting. Java doesn't have the ability to lay out uh, arrays of objects or arrays of structures. We only have an array of references. And the references are then off to objects that could be anywhere, all over a heap, and completely unpredictable. Now we've been spending a lot of time arguing about things like invoke dynamic and lambdas and all of these other things. Why do we not have arrays of structures? Why do we not have the means to actually lay out memory in a sensible fashion? A really simple example, a string. We have a pointer to an object. That object internally has a character array. It's not actually embedded in the object, it's a pointer off to a character array. We're pointer chasing all of the time. Where that string, if we had the array in co-located with the actual semantics for describing the string itself, we're a lot less likely to get a cache miss. Remember that ability that we could be losing 500 CPU cycles. If it's actually a 3 gigahertz processor with the ability to retire four instructions per second, the actual worst case scenario is we're missing 1,200 instructions for a one cache miss. Why are these things not more front and center? So we're saying like, we don't need to understand this stuff. We do need to understand some of this. It's not that we need to understand a massive amount of detail. Like, the, the complexity that is in some of our frameworks is much greater than the complexity of just knowing how basic memory works and how we show patterns of access. This is not overly complex. We just abdicate any responsibility for learning these things these days. It's become a cultural thing. So with Java as the example, which, what things can you do to improve your cache miss ratio. Like you, you give an example of a string where there is something which is a class which has data fields but yet is not a cohesive entity which is spread about the heap. Mm -hmm. How do you profile your code and how do you refactor your code to take advantage of these capabilities? So if you do have a performance problem you want to kind of start and approach it top down, usually language down. And the best way is to start with a standard language profiler. Like cheap and cheerful, that could be Java Visual VM, doing something. You'll find out which methods are spending the majority of time. You'll probably find in those cases it will be one of three basic things. It's usually a case of you're making remote calls to your database and you find that you're spending all of your time calling into the JDBC driver. The other thing that's quite often the case is you're parting data at the front end coming back in. And we seem to be obsessed these days with parsing XML, JSON, and all sorts of 
tax protocols. We use tax protocols so that we can read them. When we're developing them, that's a one-off exercise. We can, so we, we can read those things. We have computers reading them the rest of the time. I like to think of it as a bit differently. Why don't we just use binary protocols? Much more efficient, much easier to parse. And if we need to parse them, we write to them. You almost think they go, the waste of CPU cycles and the amount of energy we're wasting around the world in data centers because we have inefficient code. You can almost be cheeky and say, don't be a tool, write a tool <laughs> to read this stuff. It's just a cop out to say we must use XML. Uh, even worse with Winston and all the namespacing and stuff that comes with that, the huge bandwidth costs. To go in further, one of the other things I find quite often is logging code. You, sometimes you profile code. I've seen one case whereby even guarded code, so if debug enabled, or is debug enabled, is called over and over, it was 6% of the total time for CPU was actually just calling. It is debug enabled, not even going inside it. There is so much of this code. And all of that code adds cyclomatic complexity. It makes methods more complicated, makes them harder to inline, makes them harder to branch predict. This, it's all of this stuff is kind of crazy. We should have much better logging improvements. And I think logging is a really interesting thing. Is it should be a first class concept. I like to think of it, do you keep a journal as you go because you need that for later analysis? Well, if you do that, let's do it right. If you're doing it for debugging purposes, that's kind of crazy. It's like, why don't you learn to use a debugger correctly? Like, we are beyond the era of printf as a means of debugging. Debuggers have greatly improved. There are some great remote debuggers that can have far more control. I like the idea of whenever I'm developing, sort of, you take the red-green refactor model. So I'm going to write some code. I'm going to write my tests for that. They're going to go red. I'm going to write the, the target code for it. It's going to go green, and then I can refactor and clean up. Quite often, people don't actually refactor. And Eric Evans made some interesting comments on that yesterday, how agile projects don't seem to produce good design because people talk a good story on refactoring and never actually do it. I think there's also two other steps in between that, that needs to happen to get good and become professional as engineers. I like to walk through code in a debugger. So it becomes a, a thing I do all day, every day. Because if you think about it, we have to debug code a lot when it goes live. At university, we don't learn to use a debugger. We don't learn to use a profiler. We don't learn to use some of the tools of our trade. We should be doing this day in, day out, getting incredibly comfortable with it. So step through that code that you've just written in a debugger. That builds up a nice, strong mental model of how something works. You've got the static code, then you've got the dynamic paths as you walk through that. That will teach a lot to anyone who reads that sort of code and then walks through the debugger and builds up that strong mental model. And you'll start seeing, well, I didn't go down that path, and that path's kind of interesting. Why don't I have a test case in place for that? I think it goes a little bit further with profiling. It's the same thing. So after we've written these nice tests, and we've walked through them and debugged them, they're comfortable. We also run a profiler. We start to get an idea of the costs of things. We become aware that some things are more costly than others. It becomes a natural thing. It's a bit like the structural engineering view of the world is what is the torsional strength of steel, what is the compression strength of concrete. We start to know these things. We can build interesting things that steel and work at sort of beyond what an individual can do. We're not just building little garden sheds quite often. We, we're paid as professional engineers to build quite complex software. Yet we, we approach that in ways that are just not as professional as other engineering disciplines. So running those things through the, the, uh, the profiler, we can build up all of that. We get an understanding of the costs. We'll know where our time is spent. Again, this is another thing that reinforces our mental models. Because statistics shows us that when we build software, we're only spending 20 to 30 percent of the time actually doing the initial build. And usually, sort of 70 to 80 percent of the time is in maintenance and debugging and all the future life of that code. Getting that stuff clean, getting it covered, getting profiling and debugging, and all going on it with the right tests really reduces that ongoing cost. It's also one of the reasons why doing stuff in an open source environment and collaborative it really reduces that cost longer term, it skills up people by getting the feedback externally, and we start to actually show what we do. I think it's interesting if I was an architect, I'm going to come along with my portfolio. As an engineer, I'll come along with my portfolio and then be interviewed for another job. We come along in software, we can't show what we've done before, we can't talk about it. We play this sort of game where we try to work out what people are capable of without any illustration of previous portfolio. It, it all feels like we still are so immature as 
like it's almost like science is any subject that needs to add science to the name is not really a science. Physics, chemistry, biology, math, they don't need to have science put on the end of it. They do it because we don't actually do it. Most people today couldn't even tell you what the scientific method is who study computer science. So going back to the memory layout within Java question discussion, there's something new was added in called byte buffer in recent version Java. I believe it was Java 7. I think it's been around longer. Oh, really? Excellent. So, so this this part of the API, it's it allows you to essentially malloc the JVM. You take a chunk of data and you can do anything and all that you want with mm -hmm. it. As I understand it, it basically wraps a byte array for all intents and purposes. So, how? Is it worth the effort to do that, to basically control your own data structure in order to be able to manage things like CPU interactions and caching, etc.? Yeah, it's a kind of interesting question. There's two, there's two types of byte buffer inside the JVM. There's a normal heap byte buffer, which is effectively just a wrap. It's, you can also have other types. You can have a res of longs, a res of shorts, or a res of any sorts of primitives that are in there. There's also a direct byte buffer, which is off heap. It's not actually a rare act. It's effectively memory that's been mollocked outside of the heap, but we can then use it and it doesn't move. That's very interesting for a number of things, particularly if we're going to do an I.O. So now what I can do is I can take one of those direct byte buffers, I can be writing to it, and whenever I then do an I.O. operation, I don't have to copy it via another buffer. Especially that can avoid copies that are kernel transitions. Where this is quite often, you'll see a lot in high frequency trading and high performance applications is people will use those buffers to lay out memory exactly how they want to lay them out so that we don't get the cache misses. You're typically laying out structures at this stage, you've not got objects with pointers to other objects, so it's collapsed flat structures. But there's a lot can be represented with that. If you look at a basic Java object, you've got a header, which is two extra words, and you've usually got interaction from some structure to get to that. I can effectively lay out arrays of structures without headers to have them very compact by doing them within a byte buffer, or so that can be direct or not direct. I can work directly on that with very predictable patterns of access and get a lot of performance. I can also avoid any garbage collection overhead because this is nice. And this is now freed from the garbage collector, so I'm not getting pauses. And okay, you're going to be limited to two gigabytes at a time. We do start doing interesting things, and that can be memory mapped. So we can start dealing with very large structures. We want to start writing that to disk or to network. It's very fast and efficient for doing that because there's not additional copies. We can take advantage of things like transfer to. It's all left on channels. You can take byte buffers. With the channels, you can call transfer to. On the likes of Linux, that will actually map to send file. So I can just take a large array of that, stream it directly to a socket as a single operating system call that doesn't copy it through user space to make these things very fast. People go further than that and actually use unsafe. And by using unsafe, I can allocate memory directly, just like I would in C, or I can manipulate one of these byte buffers. That makes it very interesting for doing things like IPC. Because now, on top of the ability to directly access it, I can also take a fact of some memory ordering semantics. I can give it things like CAS instructions and build up an unblocking algorithm so I can communicate between different processes using memory map files. This is way faster than anything you'll get with sockets. You can go into the many tens of millions of messages a second streamed between processes without any garbage collection and without all of the overhead of kernel transitions for making these calls. It's all user space to user space. In the high frequency trading space and other high performance, there's a lot of these techniques get used often.